Hello again guys and welcome to another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial. Today we're going to be talking about the FMC setup. I'm going to show you exactly what information you need to put in pre-departure to ensure a safe and efficient flight. So we're currently in Madrid and we're going to simulate a flight to Ibiza. So, a little bit of background information about the flight management computer. Uh, we basically have two on board and we can manipulate the FMC using the CDU, uh, which is these two boxes, the common display unit. Uh, that's how we communicate with the FMC. Uh, the FMC has two databases, a navigation database and a performance database, and it uses all this information uh, to manipulate the autopilot with LNAV and VNAV and the autofrontal to ensure we are doing the flight as efficiently as possible. So, uh, first thing we do, uh, I've already aligned the IRSs, so uh, they've been in NAV uh, for a few minutes and they've just aligned, uh, which you do on the first flight of the day, and then we'll go straight away to the FMC. So there's no information in the FMC at the moment. First thing we need to do is go uh, to init ref page and then index and then to ident. We always start on this page. Now, first thing it's going to say is nav data out of date. So in real life, we'd contact the engineers, get them to update the navigational database. In flight sim, we're not too bothered. Uh, it's expired in 2017 in January. It's pretty much up to date. There's been very few changes. Uh, they're updated every 28 days. So we check that, uh, the model and the engine rating. There's some information about the FMC here. It's more applicable to engineers. Next we go to pause in it, and we need to tell the FMC where we are, so it knows where its last position was, which is pretty correct uh, in Madrid, however the aircraft might have moved since then by a tug, or, or towed, or whatever really. So what we do, we put the reference airport here, and you can see the coordinates are slightly different. That's the reference coordinate for Madrid. Now Madrid is a massive international airport, we need to be a bit more specific to where we are. Now some operators use the gate locator, uh, what we do for my company, uh, we actually tell us uh, GPS coordinates. So now the aircraft's been powered up, so the GPS is updated. And GPS, as you know, most of you have got sat down to the car, is incredibly accurate. Uh, we can use this information and we can put the information here. Now, because I've already aligned the IRSs, uh, there would usually be a set coordinates box here. Now, because they're already aligned, uh, you don't need to put that information in. Uh, so if you're just on the first line of the day, put those coordinates there. And when the IRS is up aligned, jobs are good and knows exactly where you are. But for now, we'll crack on. Next we go to the route page and we need to tell uh, now the aircraft where we are, uh, which it knows is Madrid, uh, and for it, that information is already there, leave it echo by Delta, and then we need to tell it where we are going, and we're going to Ibiza, so we put the four letter ICAO code in there for Ibiza, which is Lima Echo India Bravo. Next we put the uh, call sign in, uh, which is going to be Flight Deck to Sim, we put that in flight number, very important that you do this correctly, uh, because that's how ATC identify you on their radar displays, and then we can put the routing in. So it's actually a very short flight from Madrid to Ibiza, uh, it's only about uh, three or four waypoints, I've got the flight plan in front of me. Uh, the first waypoint after departure is Nando. Uh, now what we do when we select Nando, the FMC database goes, okay I've got four waypoints called Nando, uh, which one is it? And if you select the top one, the top one's the one that's closest to you. So this one is a, a lot further south. This one's in the southern hemisphere. Uh, PMDG have the entire database here for you to use in flight sim. Uh, in reality, uh, a company like mine, which only operates in Europe, we'd only have a European database. So it would only be pretty much one Nando to choose. But I can tell you it's this one here that we've selected. Via, we're going to use a SID later, but we don't put that information in at the moment. After Nando, we're going to use an airway to the next waypoint, and that's Upper Tango 252nd put in on the left so via is the airway and then uh, we put the direct to next waypoint so you don't always have uh, airways to go direct to uh, sometimes you just if you leave it bank and put the next waypoint in it just says direct so after last boat I put Varut there you go it's going direct to Varut but we are still going to use an airway uh, which as you know is pretty much a highway if we use in the sky and that's a Pazulu 224 oops just press the wrong button um, Upper Zulu 224, and there we go, we can change the direct now, it's updated to the And Varit's the start of the arrival into IB. Now we've got the basic routing information, we can go to departures, we can select the people departure. Firstly, we choose the runway. So the surface wind in Madrid at the moment is 3605 knots, so they've been using 36 left departure. And that narrows all the SIDs for runway 36 left, that was a Nando 2 November, and then we simply select it. Then go to the arrivals, so IB for arrivals choose the arrival runway so it's ILS Zulu runway 06 and then the star uh, not all airports have stars so uh, most international airports do and the arrival into IB is going to be a Varit uh, 1 Victor departure which I've got off my flight plan and there it is Varit 1 Victor 
Uh, now, there are, there are transitions, but I know in IB for that after VAR, I'm very likely to get the radar vector, so I'm not going to select one. Uh, and then what we do before we activate the routes, we go to plan page, uh, and then what that does, we get step enunciate here. So I just put the end, oh, try to drag the MD over here. And then we just step through uh, to make sure there's no discontinuities. Oh look, we do have a discontinuity. That's fine, very common. Now after till no, uh, after Varrett and then till no, we can get radar vectors onto the approach, the ILS, okay? So all I'm going to simply do is line select here. And then we've got, well, get rid of all the discontinuities. And in real, real life, I'd be for uh, radar after Varrett or before till no, we'll give you a radar vector heading onto the ILS approach. So once that's complete, we activate it. However, remember in real life it's a multi crew environment, we wouldn't actually execute it yet in my operator. That's because we need to check the routing with the other uh, pilot before we do anything. The other things you do during departure uh, before you execute the route as well is modify anything in the FMC. So you'd look at the uh, departure plate, make sure all the waypoints are in there correctly, all the altitude and uh, speed restrictions as well. We're stepping through it, we have a restriction 70 above by uh, 237 Juliet. Check that's in the plate as well. And the stop cleared level is like level 130 or above by uh, Papa Delta Tango, that's in the FMC as well. So you can actually manipulate any of the points or what we actually do in my operator, uh, if I zoom out slightly. You can see it's quite a steep turn there. Uh, don't want to be doing that at 250 knots, so what I'm going to do here is at the Juliet point there, or actually at the intercept point, put a speed limit of 220 knots or below. That way we can ensure that we're not going to overshoot any of the waypoints. And if I put that at intercept, I'll ensure when I execute the route that in uh, VNAV we're not going to do more than 220 knots and then once we're after this point here we can delete the speed restriction and accelerate the aircraft. So that's it, we won't execute it as I said until we have checked it with the other pilot. Next we go to init ref page and then we do the uh, initial performance again. This is done both with uh, both the other crew member in the fly deck to confirm the performance is correct. So what we do, we just put estimated information in. The estimated zero fuel weight uh, for this flight, which is based on uh, the operational flight plan, how many passengers we've got, is 61.2. So that's the weight of the aircraft without any fuel on board. So the zero fuel weight, 61.2, plus the fuel, 5.3, is the gross weight, which is 66.5. I have this cruise CAG figure. Uh, now in our fleet, this is default to 5%. That's because it's the most conservative CFG setting during the cruise ensures the um, uh, maximum margin uh, when we're flying at higher cruise levels. You can't actually change this in the FMC, uh, so in our aircraft it's 5%, 23 is fine for the simulator to use at home, guys. Next you put the reserve fuel for the flight, so the reserves for this flight, I just check the OFP, uh, is 2.4 uh, tonnes. Now this is the amount of fuel we need to do a go around in IB for divert to our alternate, uh, which is Palma de Mallorca and do uh, an ILS approach down that and land with minimum reserve fuel which is 30 minutes. Then put the cost index which is uh, 30. This figure here is basically a uh, figure derived from the company. Uh, the lower the cost index, the slower you fly, the less fuel you burn. The higher the cost index, the, the faster you fly uh, and uh, the more fuel you burn but there's less time for the engines running. So uh, it's derived from the operational fly plan. 30 is a very common one used from my operator. Next we update the uh, cruise flight level, so in the operational flight plan uh, it says we're going to be at flight level 280, so I'll put 280 here. And next we put the cruise wind as well, so we don't execute this either yet, um, but uh, the cruise wind uh, is top of climb wind, okay, so 286 and 24 knots, so this is the wind as soon as we reach top of climb. Now this is quite important because uh, your climb speed using Econ climb speed is, uh, uses a lot of information. It uses your cost index and one of the information it uses is your cruise wind. Now if you have a very strong tailwind at your cruise level, um, the aircraft will climb slower uh, at a slower speed which makes uh, means that you actually climb quicker. Uh, that means that you get to your uh, top climb quicker and you can utilise that uh, tailwind. The same applies if you had a very strong headwind at your cruise level, uh, your, the aircraft will climb at a higher speed, that means it's climbing slower because it doesn't want to get into that headwind any quicker than it has to. Uh, so it's very important to use that wind, you can get that information online for free on lots of uh, uh, weather related websites. Next we have the transition altitude, so the transition altitude in Madrid is 13,000 feet, so uh, below this altitude we fly altitudes based on the local QNH which is 1002. 
above this we fly flight levels which is based on standard setting which is uh, all around the world 1013 this information is the performance so uh, here we set all the information uh, about thrust settings but in real life we'd leave this blank at this point again we need to check that with the other pilot so he'll be doing a walk around at this point same on the takeoff page we go for flat five and then we wouldn't accept the speed just yet until the other pilots completed the uh, walk around now uh, we'll talk about the performance in a little bit while so the pilot monitoring will do his walk around he'd come back on uh, do his checks and then we check the routing so he'd go yeah okay let's check the routing we've got madrid ib for the call sign step through all the points check the progress page the distance is correct and then once that's happened go back to route and now we can execute now the uh, uh, navigation database is active uh, and we can use elm after departure we then do the rest of those pre-flight checks and eventually at some point we get the load sheet now the load sheet is the performance of the aircraft some operators do it a bit differently but this piece of paper is a massive balance we use this uh, in my company to determine the takeoff for us setting so what we do uh, okay the first officer would tell the captain what the actual zero fuel weight is so it's a bit heavier 61.5 now i know in the pmdg you can click this twice and give you an actual zero fuel weight and then he'd check the gross weight 66.8 uh, make sure it's pretty similar to what it says on the load sheet any big differences with it or discrepancies we'd have to discuss as a crew uh, but then we would execute next we'd do the performance so in madrid today uh, i'm using real um, uh, weather conditions based on a training program we're doing in my company at the moment so it's currently at 38 degrees outside in madrid and madrid is a very high altitude airport it's 2000 feet so the density altitude is uh, pretty high uh, and the performance has been affected even though it's a long runway uh, the boeing opt app says we have to use full 26,000 pounds of thrust okay so we can't actually use a lower d rate which is what we'd always do first so it says we have to take full 26,000 pounds of thrust but we can assume temperature reduction now assume temperature reduction is a way of basically tricking the engines telling it's hotter that way we can uh, lower the power slightly to save fuel uh, uh, the engine life's improved etc etc so how do we do a shown temperature reduction we put the temperature here 48 degrees and it's reduced thrust slightly to 98.5% and that's our takeoff thrust setting uh, but there's one other thing I want to show you okay currently the APU is running so we'll put it on the bus now so it's providing electrical power uh, open the isolation valve and if we took the APU bleed on watch what happens to these thrust figures they reduce now, when we take off, we usually now uh, have the air conditioning packs on auto because we want to provide uh, conditioned air to the cabin and pressurization. So, uh, this is the actual thrust setting for takeoff when the engines are running. Turn the APU bleed off, it goes back to 98.5, and we'd actually use that if we really need the performance. We can do what we call a, a no uh, engine bleeds takeoff to get that extra bit of oomph from the engines. But if we put the APU bleed on, it reduces the thrust setting for departure. And if it was 38 degrees outside like we had in the sim today, you would definitely have the APU bleed on anyway to provide cool air for the cabin. So now we have the takeoff thrust set. Next we go to the takeoff page. Uh, verify we had the flat five thrust setting. The trim as well. Now I know you guys don't have the uh, luxury of a load sheet performance completed for you, but in real life in my company certainly, uh, the CFG is calculated using a load sheet and it tells us the trim setting. So it says for today you have 5.2 units of trim which we'd set. Thankfully PMDG have got the beauty of you having the ability to put the CFG by clicking like that. And there you go, my load sheet for my company says 5.2, this is 5.04. The difference in that is negligible. If you can set 5.04 units of trim, uh, you can work for my company. Uh, but then we'd set that using the uh, stab trim as well. And that means on rotation, the aircraft's nicely and trimmed in the, uh, in the event of an engine failure. So there we go, that's about 5 units of trim set. And then we'd verify the takeoff speeds. V1 is your uh, reject takeoff speed, maximum reject takeoff speed. So above this speed, we cannot reject a takeoff. We need to continue. Uh, VR is the speed at which we're going to take off, rotate. And V2 is the best engine out climb speed. So if an engine failure, uh, this is going to give us our best climb at uh, 146 knots, which we set in the MCP window. And that, guys, is pretty much it. And the FMC is fully set up, ready for. Well that's it guys, that's the end of the uh, FMC setup tutorial, I hope you found that useful. It was actually requested by quite a few of you so that's why I did it. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to, to show you in the future, uh, feel free to message me. And if you have any questions about 737-800 operations with the aircraft itself, I'm uh, more than happy to help you answer those. Uh, 
that as well. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe, and I'll see you on another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial in the very near future. Once again, thank you very much for watching.